Welcome to the Ruckus Associate Smart Zone Administrator demonstration series for the Smart Zone OS 5 release. In this series of demonstrations, we'll show you the functionality of Smart Zone OS 5, along with the basic configuration of many aspects of the controller. Smart Zone OS 5 is the network controller operating system that's available on the Smart Zone 100 and Smart Zone 300 platforms, and as we'll be discussing here, the virtual Smart Zone network controller platform. This presentation describes the requirements and processes of registering Ruckus access points to the Smart Zone network controller running Smart Zone OS 5. Here are our objectives. Over the course of this demonstration, we'll discuss some of the things that must be considered when attempting to register an AP to the Smart Zone network controller, the process in which an AP discovers the Smart Zone network controller, the actual AP registration process after discovery is completed, and finally, rules that can be applied to the registering AP to simplify and automate the registration process. Before we get into the actual process of registering an access point to the controller, just want to do a quick overview on some of the considerations when you are going through that process of registering an AP to a controller. I'm going to run through two scenarios here. They're mostly the same, but there are some slight differences between the two different versions of the Smart Zone OS whether you're running the Essentials Edition, which runs on the Smart Zone 100 hardware platform, or the High Scale Edition Virtual Smart Zone that also is the same OS that runs on the Smart Zone 300 hardware platform. So let's walk through that process. So the first thing we're going to need to perform the registration process is we're going to have to ask a couple questions of ourselves. Number one from the AP standpoint is what firmware is the access point running and how will that influence its connection to the controller? Then the next is, how does the access point find the controller? So should we do this as manually, or is there an automated process that we can use to allow them to establish connection to the controller? Now once that's done, they're going to begin reaching out to the controller, looking to uh, get that access to it. Now once they hit the controller, the controller has some questions that need to be answered before the access point can actually register. And number one is, does the controller policy actually allow this access point to connect? And then particular to the Essentials version or the Smart Zone 100 hardware platform is do I need to manually approve this access point or can I automate that process as well? So these are some of the things we're going to think about and we're going to go through as we walk through the process of registering an access point to the Smart Zone network controller running Smart Zone OS 5. Okay, so the first step is to confirm the firmware that's running on our APs. We have two ways of doing that. We can do that through the web interface, which we'll look at here real quick. Uh, I have a default AP right here that I've connected to. Using the default login of super and sp-admin, and we'll log in here. And as soon as we get to here, on the main page, we'll see the information we're looking for, and it's the software version listed over here. And you can see we're running 104.0.0.0.1347. So this is the firmware we have running on this active bank of firmware on this AP. Now, the other way to look at this is we can look at this through the CLI through an SSH connection into the AP. So here I have a connection to the AP. Uh, let's go ahead and log in. Super SP admin, we're at the CLI here, and we're going to run the command. We're going to run the firmware show all command. Uh, this command will give us information uh, related to the firmware. And some of the most interesting things we can see here is that we can see what boot image is used uh, for booting this AP right now. And we can see that there are two different image locations. There's an image one and an image two, and they can both hold different firmwares. Uh, in the case here, we booted from firmware image two, which if we look down here, we see is that 104.0.0.0.1347. And if we look up at image one as well, we have the same firmware in both of those locations. This is the current firmware that's shipping on Ruckus APs right now. So now that we've established the firmware that I'm running in my environment, let's talk about some of the other firmware variants you might see and the impact that they're going to have on the process of registering an AP to the Smart Zone Network Controller running Smart Zone OS 5. So if we have a uh, AP with some code, maybe it was managed by a zone director, and if that zone director had code prior to the 9.12 release of zone director, or if it's a factory shipped access point using code that's prior to 104.x code release, those are going to use the lightweight access point protocol to try to register with the Smart Zone Network Controller. So they use a different protocol than any of the APs that run later than that. So let's take a look at those. If we have zone director code 9.12 or greater, 
or a factory shipped access point using code 104.x or greater and smart zone code 3.x or greater uh, those are going to use the SSH or secure shell protocol to register with the smart zone network controller now the controller by default only listens to and will register APs using the SSH protocol but that's just the default behavior we do have a mechanism and a means of allowing the controller to listen to LWAP or lightweight access point protocol and listen to APs that are using those protocols to allow them to register so let's take a look at how that's done our first opportunity to register these LWAP APs to the smart zone network controller is during the initial setup in the setup wizard and the cluster information configuration and this is done by checking the box for AP conversion the one that says convert zone director APs in factory settings to virtual smart zone APs automatically this allows a policy to listen to LWAP from these APs and convert them over to smart zone APs automatically After initial setup, the only way to modify the LWAP policy is through the CLI of the Smart Zone Network Controller itself. So let's go ahead and log into my controller here. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in my password here. CLI is coming up. Uh, now that it's up, I'll get into enable mode. I'll have to input my password again. And now I'm at my main prompt. Uh, from here, I can run a command that lets me view the current policy and that command is the show run LWAP to SCG command. And what we can see here is the default setting. The default is to accept these LWAP connections. So we can change that and deny those so that we don't let any uh, controllers come in or any APs connect to our controller that are either too old or were previously connected to a zone director. So to change this policy, we go to configuration mode with the config command. We get into the LWAP to SCG configuration context, and we can change this by using the policy command, and the options are either deny all or accept all. We'll run the policy deny all command here. Once we've run that command, we have to press end to actually get us out and save the change, and it'll prompt us, do we want to save this change? We'll say yes press return here and now we can view this policy again I'm just going to use the up arrow and go back to the previously run command and here's the show run LWAP to SCG and now we can see the policy is in deny all mode I can change it back by again getting into config changing to LWAP to SCG once I'm in that context I use the same policy command and now I change it back to accept all hit return type end and confirm that I want to make these changes and I'll show you the policy again and we'll see that now we're back to the default configuration that we had before of accept all. Now that we've got the AP firmware worked out let's talk about how to instruct that AP to find a controller. We essentially have three ways of doing this. We can do this using the web UI of the AP itself, we can do it through the CLI of the AP itself, or we can provide it automatically through DHCP using option 43. Let's take a look at each of these. So over here at the web UI, we can actually provide the controller's IP address by clicking over here under administration and clicking on management. Once this comes up, there's a section down here to set the controller address and you need to do a reboot for this to take effect. So we enable setting the controller address and we put in the address right here. So there's our controller address. We have the option to put in a secondary controller address. What we'll do is come down here and hit the update settings and a reboot will have to occur for this to take effect. But we can see up top that our parameters were saved. Now over here at the AP CLI, we have a couple commands that are available to us to manage, look at, and configure controller IP information. The get scg command allows us to look at the current configuration and what we can see here is the server list has the IP address we just applied over there at the web UI. So that information is saved here. Now we also have the ability to delete some of this information using the CLI as well. And this is done with the set scg ip delete command. And what we get back from that is just a simple OK. So we can confirm that that indeed 
took away the controller IP address in the get SCG output. Now we can go ahead and run the set SCG IP and give it the controller address and we can define it here. Now we're putting in the same address but that's okay. Just wanted to show you the functionality of how we can manipulate, manage, add, and delete the controller IP addresses directly through the CLI of the AP. So if we do the get SCG command again, we'll see that that server list is still in there. Just like the web UI, the CLI gives you the ability to manage all of the IP information for which controllers to reach out to for controlling these APs. So for those DHCP admins out there, uh, we can actually provide the smart zone controller address through the DHCP using option 43, which is the customer specific option. Uh, so basically the AP will send out the DHCP discover the server will send back a response and in it it will have option 43 and specific for the smart zone network controller it'll be code 6 and that code uh, will include the IP address of the controller when that gets returned to the access point the access point will then go out and look for that controller now again this is specific for DHCP admin uh, this can be something where you provide it to everyone and it's ignored by the other clients who don't support option 43 or you can create separate pools uh, for the limited client base based on the vendor class so you can identify these APs and only provide this option back to them but that's a lesson for another course and really specific to how DHCP function and not necessarily what we're doing here for smart zone AP registration now once we've used one of these three methods to instruct our access point to reach the controller we'll see a message in the controllers log in the event log showing the access point trying to make contact Let's take a look at that on a virtual smart zone high scale controller. So here we are at the high scale controller. We can see down here at the bottom that there's an AP discovery uh, succeeded message. So the AP has made sent a discovery message to the controller based on the IP address that we provided it. And we see a message logging that here. Now we also see up in the main window, we see the access point itself listed up here and the zone that it's in and it's in the staging zone. So on a high scale controller, when an access point first connects to the controller, it gets put into a staging zone, which we can see down here. Uh, I have a controller here with several different domains and partner domains and team domains, uh, but the AP itself will always be put into the staging zone in the default AP group by default. Okay, so let's take a look at what just happened. Uh, once the access point has the address of the controller, it initiates a discovery process by contacting the controller with information about its current capabilities, uh, including its hardware, its firmware, uh, radio types, encryption services, and things like that. And if the access point is compatible with the controller's configuration, uh, the controller will respond with information that the access point needs, including the control plane addresses, uh, data plane addresses if they're configured, and it'll instantly all SSH uh, certificates. And if all this matches and everything's approved by both devices, then the access point begins the registration and configuration process. Um, here the firmware will be changed to whatever the smart zones firmware is uh, for whatever zone it goes into, but that doesn't happen immediately and it depends on a few other factors that we're going to talk about here in just a minute. Now let's refresh what we just saw with the access point trying to register with the high scale controller. Um, the high scale controller and the essentials controller perform mostly the same functionality. The process is close to identical, but there are a few key differences that I want to show you here. So let's just uh, review what we saw with the high scale controller. Um, so in both cases, you're going to see a discovery. You're going to see the installation of the SSH search on the AP from the controller. And then on the high scale controller, you're going to see the AP and the default AP group in the staging zone, which is what we just showed you a moment ago. Now let's take a look over at the Essentials Edition and see what happens over there after the discovery process. Okay, so I'm over here at my Virtual Smart Zone Essentials Edition where I have another AP. Uh, I just connected this AP to the controller. I, I went into the AP, provided the controller's IP address, and it established a connection. And you can see here that this AP was put into the default zone by default. Uh, so basically when an AP joins to an Essentials Edition controller with default settings, uh, that AP will automatically be put into the default zone. Now this behavior can be changed. You can actually disable this functionality and require an AP be approved before it actually uh, gets put into a zone. So it'll actually just sit in a, 
more or less a limbo state until you as an active administrator decide you want to put the AP into a specific zone. So that's done over here under system and AP settings and you have the approval tab here. So toggling this switch to off will require you to manually approve every AP that tries to connect to this controller and not place it into that default zone. So if we say OK here, it'll submit that form and now uh, we'll be sure to have to actually go through and approve APs. And that's done back over here at Access Points. Uh, when you see an AP in the system, it'll, it'll be grayed out here for us, but you can select that access point here, and under the More button, there's an Approve that would be black and an option for you to click over here if this one weren't already approved that would allow you to approve the AP and connect it to a zone on this controller in your network. So back over here with an Essentials Edition, uh, we send the discovery, install the SSH certification, and the next step would be to wait for approval if you have that option enabled or disabled in our case, uh, disable auto approval, you'd have to wait for that approval, and then once that approval is done, then it would put the AP into the default zone. Our next and final step in this process of registering the AP is to move the access point from the default zone, which uh, on the Essentials controller is where it will be placed in the uh, default zone and the default AP group, uh, is to move that AP to the zone we actually want it to operate in. So to do that, we just click on the AP itself and select the Move button. And once we click the Move button, it gives us the option of places we can move this AP within our network. So we can move it over to this Team X zone in the default AP group. We'll say OK there. I get a pop-up that asks me, are we sure we want to move this AP to that group? We'll say yes. And this AP will move over, and you see it vacating the default zone and being moved to the zone I just moved it over to. OK, and then next let's take a look at the same thing from our high scale controller. So I have the high scale controller. The move option is actually really still the same process, uh, but here it's in the staging zone in the default AP group of the staging zone. So I just select the AP, select move, and I can move it to any zone I have configured in this domain. We'll move it to the partner X zone, say OK. Again, it'll confirm we want to make that move, uh, give it the target zone configuration it's going to change. Now we just click yes here and confirm that we've moved the AP to the new zone. So let's take a look at what happens next after we move it into an actual zone that's uh, not the default zone or the staging zone on the high scale controller. So we move the AP to the appropriate zone. Uh, then the zone configuration and the zone firmware is pushed back to the AP. So at this point, the APs, if they're running lower versions of code than what's on the controller, that new firmware would be pushed out and the AP would reboot, and then it would apply the zone's configuration. Then any tunnels would be established from the AP back to the controller, and then it would report its health. And then we'd be up and running with the AP reporting anything that's going on back up to the controller, any events that occur, any errors, any alarms, or anything else would automatically be sent up to the controller for your review. And one last important note is that the web UI for the AP itself, once it's connected to the controller, will not be accessible by you anymore. The only way to manage the AP is through the controller interface itself or through a CLI connection using SSH. Now that we've looked at the default behavior of an AP when it uh, registers to a smart zone network controller, uh, let's take a look at something we can do to allow the AP to not be put into one of those default zones and have to be manually moved, but let's look at uh, AP registration policies that will allow us to identify some factor in the access point itself to determine what zone we want to place that access point in and automate the process of moving it to the zone. It's over here under System and then AP settings. And in AP settings, we have the AP registration tab. So to do this, we simply click the create button here. Uh, we give it a description, just a name that helps us identify it. 
we'll just call it a whatever rule we want partner X then you're gonna select the zone you want to move any APs that match this criteria to so we'll select this uh, partner X zone and then we have a couple of different values we can filter on for this rule to identify an access point as being a member of this zone and would then be automatically put into this zone and all of the configurations firmware upgrades and everything else would be applied so we can do that by a range of IP addresses with a starting IP address and an ending IP address we can specify a subnet, which is just an IP network and a subnet mask associated with it. We can use GPS coordinates that are configured on the AP when it registers to the controller, or a provisioning tag. Now before we close out this presentation, I wanted to show you this chart that gives you some information about which ports and which protocols are used for communications between APs and controllers. Uh, these are very important, especially if the APs are outside of a firewall and you're going to have to open up ports in your firewall to allow communication to happen. So take a second to pause the presentation on this and take a look at some of these ports that are going to be necessary. Uh, we have a lot of different communications that go on, uh, many control protocols that are used for the AP to communicate with the controller for things like uh, uploads of reports and stats and configuration backups for SSH tunnels, for firmware upgrades, for registration requests. Uh, we also have some management ports that need to be opened and the, some of these are the defaults and some of these can be changed as well but these are all the default ports that are used including data plane protocols and ports. So again pause, take a look at this information, uh, get to know which ports are used by the APs and the controllers and communications with each other and consider those if you're running a firewall in between your access point and your controllers. This concludes this presentation covering access point registration. The presentation is part of the Ruckus Associate Smart Zone Administrator demonstration series for Smart Zone OS 5. There are many other demonstrations detailing configuration processes and options, so I hope to see you back for more presentations in the future. Thank you.